Our next interview is with a gathering. We have uh, Bob Dalton Harris and we have Diane Deblois. See, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce those kinds of names. Okay, just uh, briefly tell us something about your background, family, schools, uh, you know, where you grew up, etc. Ladies first. Ah, well, as you might guess by my name, I'm Canadian, and I would still be in Canada if it weren't for the Boston Book Fair of 1978, hmm. because Rob was had a booth in that book fair, and one of my old college friends from McGill University, where I went to school, came to the fair, and he met Rob and kept his card in his wallet. Two weeks later, in a big blizzard, my car breaks down on my way to a class reunion at McGill, or not at McGill, but at this friend's yeah. house. And when he rescues me, he's from out of state, I'm from out of country. The person who's going to fix my car won't take either an out of country credit card or an out of state check, and we have not enough cash. And he said, but wait a minute, I met a guy who's a bookseller and he works out of his home and he doesn't live too far from here. Maybe he can cash a check. So that's how you met him? That's how I met him. That's how I got introduced to the book business. Mm -hmm. I had never even imagined it. I wasn't a collector. I, I was a teacher at the time. And uh, so that's the, back, the book background is 1978 Thanksgiving introduced him and introduced to the whole idea that people collected rare books, that they could have a business doing this. It was great. Pretty amazing, huh? Pretty amazing, <laughs> huh? Well, what about yourself? Uh, background, where you grew up, etc. Yes, I was born in Salt Lake. Most people who were born in Salt Lake are Mormons. My background is with the uh, Mormon Church. Uh, my great, great ancestor published the Book of Mormon. Uh, Quick, he's not Mormon now. He's not Mormon now. Uh, an event in the book world uh, motivated my uh, request to be excommunicated, excommunicated from that church. Uh, the Mark Hoffman case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for uh, my father died when I was ten. My mother went back to school, got her own degree. We moved college towns to uh, from Bozeman to Corvallis, Oregon. I went through high school there. Went to college at Stanford. Got a bachelor of science in physics, and then a, an advanced degree in physics uh, at Resler Polytechnic Institute. I was married at that time, um, and considered my responsibility of my family to. Uh, require me to try to negotiate the terrain of the Vietnam War, Cold War. I went through Air Force ROTC, ROTC got a commission, uh, deferred my active duty to get my advanced degree at RPI, was called to active duty at Special Weapons Laboratory. My first assignment was to finish my dissertation and to give lectures on how to shoot ICBMs down with lasers. <laughs> <laughs> me, wow. and a, yeah, me and another team of uh, <laughs> other members of the team of theoretical physics physicists regarded that as ridiculous and uh, given the opportunity to uh, uh, take an early out I resigned my commission from the Air Force uh, threw up my profession for my hobby which had been from youth uh, as a stamp collector, but uh, with a great affinity for old houses and paper and the like, uh, and an opportunity to buy the estate of an antiquarian bookseller, did so. And who was the bookseller? Uh, e. Uh, let's Button. See, Button, Lysander Button, in Waterford, New York. Mm. Um, and I had early help from a couple of the bookselling fraternity with whom uh, you know, I formed good relations and was much impressed with it. It seemed like a respectable thing to do, so I learned <laughs> and uh, in, in that process and given the opportunities of that particular estate, there was a lot of ephemera. I found that my affinities were for the materials which had yet to be catalogued and described and so forth and sort of moved successively beyond just rare books to a combination of rare books and manuscripts and ephemera and then finally just ephemera helped or was a, uh, a charter member of the ephemera society of great britain and was there when the u.s society was formed um, the transformation of my life from a prospective professional physicist college professor to a bookseller 
uh, was not the, was not good for my first marriage. I had divorced uh, by, by the time that I had met Diane, and um, and was delighted in her to find a partner for for this. Uh, yeah, it suits our life. Yeah, it suits down our life. to the ground. Yeah. How long um, after you guys met during the blizzard did you start? Up. Well, the interesting thing is because I had a career that I was very fond of and owned a great house and had a great group of friends, I wasn't in any mood to quickly give that up and join this strange person in his strange <laughs> occupation. So um, whenever possible, I would fly down from Quebec and join Rob doing a show. So we did... We couldn't have done Boston, obviously, but we did do the New York Fair that year, and we did a couple of the philatelic events. He wanted me to see whether this is something I would actually enjoy doing. And his way of doing it was to sort of not just have me there as an adjunct, but to actually make me take over a portion. Put her on the line. Yeah. yeah and cool. I loved it. You loved it. So I had to re-upped my contract in April 1979, and I didn't, <laughs> and moved down in May. And uh, Did you become a citizen? I did. I waited until my mother died. Oh, okay. um, so I became a citizen in September 2001. Wow. First group of new citizens to be sworn in in Albany after 9-11. was oh, a right. very emotional time. It must have been. Yeah. Scary time for a lot of people. Too. Yeah, yeah, it was very but interesting. But it's worked out very well for the both of you. Oh yeah. Um, so, what are some of the recollections you have of your early years in the trade? Tell me about some of the people who were mentors, uh, some of the people who you asked for advice, some of the people you looked up to, or you know that that kind of transition. Uh, Rocky Gardner. Anybody right. oh. loves Rocky? Well. <laughs> Boston Book Fair. You know, we always had the booth right next to Rocky mm -hmm. so we could help out mm -hmm. and so we could listen in on him saying, this is really terse. <laughs> yeah, and it, with the glasses down on his nose. Oh, nice. yeah. So for sure, Rocky and Avis. Yeah. Avis particularly for me because, oh, yeah. yeah, Rocky because... It was before I came along. But Avis, knowing that by and large, the women in partnerships, they're going to be the ones to take care of the money yeah, and the accounts, and oh, she was great. So for sure them. Um, and Rocky died way too soon. Well, you say that about a lot of people. Yeah, we do. We do, but he... Trade, yeah. yeah, I know. Um, there was another bookseller who's... Uh, when I had that first lot of antiquarian books, and I wanted to raise my uh, understanding in the quickest possible fashion, I invited a bookseller to uh, come and visit, and I gave him first pick, but he, he had to agree to tell me why, ah. why he was buying each book, how much he was offering, and how much he expected to sell it for, yeah. so to get a sense of the the monetary terrain on which that all, all was to happen. That was a very... Who was he? Um, Ken, not Ken. Mm. It was Ken Sorry. Rosenberg. Uh, <clears throat> the name will come to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's sometimes it's a little difficult for us little time. Is. <laughs> yes, yeah. <thank> you. <laughs> yeah, we're all I silverbacks think, I think now. I, know, I think I know who you mean, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, I'm not sure his name either. But there have been a lot of great booksellers. Yeah, I've, it's not a trade that's. Uh, uh, it does have its villains and uh, so forth. But I found uh, I, I found that trust was really uh, a good leading strategy, and uh, actually, usually actually, usually yeah. is repaid in uh, mm -hmm. any of the transactions with our colleagues and our customers as well. Uh, are you guys internet savvy? No. Well, or savvy. Well, savvy. We decided early on to not do business okay. through the internet. And you know, I was, I was thinking about that because people have been remarking how the internet business has deteriorated. And I was remembering that the first time that I had the 
really strong impression that this was not going to be the good way to go was when we were visiting um, down in Austin, visiting uh, Jenkins. And it was in the 80s, and they were so excited because they had just figured out that they could keep electronically the different um, entries for particular books, and then they'd never have to do them again. They'd get the same book again. They'd just plug in, and I thought, and what fun is that? To some people, it sounds like yeah, right. Like and I thought, mm, I I don't System. think so. Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, to some people, it's progress. And so we just it's a pain. It didn't feel yeah, like it. It didn't, it didn't feel, feel like, like what yeah. we were really enjoying. So doing. you actually do zero business. Zero on the internet. All of your business is done through through listings, quotations, uh, book right. fairs, etc. And we've uh, broadened our attachment to the culture of books and ephemera by participating in as authors and editors and we do a lot of appraising there's a uh, we, uh, and helping to arrange symposia and programs of various sorts we appreciate that there's a deep culture of participation and we uh, yeah. try to keep uh, a hand in all of it that we know about what part do, do book play, book fairs play in the total scope of your business well, in the beginning, it was the first Everything. real respectable venue to offer the kinds of things that we were drawn to, uh, doing book fairs in Boston, New York, and then on the California coast, alternating between San Francisco and Los Angeles. We sort of preceded the interest in ephemera out there and, and saw it grow. Oh, yeah. And, mm. and it, it be, uh, we were able to convince our colleagues, ourselves, and our customers that it was a suitable, complementary uh, collectible. And uh, fine book, fair, book fairs are at least half of our exposure to the public. You know, we do the Boston Book Fair, we do still do the California Book Fairs, and we do, uh, we helped organize the regional book fair in Albany and did have done many of the regional book fairs in Rochester over the yeah. years. So you do do the regionals as well as as well as the, the national. Fewer That's all the time. When I met Rob, he was doing fifty three shows a year. Oh Antique shows, <laughs> flea markets. It was dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> the, what kind of a life is that? <laughs> Not <laughs> much. Well, Not was much. It, you're starting up and still supporting a family and paying a mortgage. I yeah. did. You know, I haven't been otherwise employed for since that time, nineteen seventy two when I did, uh, actually subsequent to the Air Force, I had another professional appointment as a physicist. It ended in the same way, my disappointment that it was a profession that at least for the uh, aspects of it that were accessible to me, largely politicized. Yeah. Mm. And I, and yeah. I didn't really want that. Because the one question that I need to ask is yeah. how long have you had that beard? <laughs> oh, well, somebody asked that at breakfast today. At breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just gross. <laughs> 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 well, there was a little girl who said, oh. Can I feel your fur? <laughs> the the answer is since the Air Force. He had a beard before, and was he it as full as, as uh, and before it was no. about as well as I could do at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but he had to shave it off for the Air Force, and oh, so required, as soon yeah. yeah, as soon as he left the Air Force, so 1970. It's a long time to have a beard. Yeah, yes. it's 39 it's that, year old beard. Now I'm stopped upon the streets and people will say, how old is your beard? You know, and my beard is this. And it's sort of an unusual so thing these days. All these bearded people, huh? <laughs> yeah, I love yeah, them. You just have to love them. Yeah, I yeah, hope so. Yeah, yeah. You just I have to love them. Um, if you were entering the book trade today, would you? And if you did, how would you go about doing it? I would not enter the book trade because we've pretty much dropped books, except for our own interest. I would enter the ephemera trade, well, though, and that, yeah, we would stay with ephemera. And, uh, you know, when we did the um, rare books and manuscripts section of the American Library Association shindig a couple of years ago, when it was, the theme was ephemera, ephemera. and we were asked to do one of the plenary sessions with Margolis and Moss. Yeah, Remember that? Ephemera, yeah. yeah, right, so the, the four of us, presented and had a wonderful time. In the, in the question period, somebody asked, why did you drop books in favor of ephemera? And my answer, just off the top of my head, was dealing in books would seem to me like just dealing in cabbages. It's, the Jenkins model. That's the Jenkins model. Yeah. It's a commodity. Yeah, and 
not interested. So I would say, and in fact, I just um, got a message through the ephemera society about a young person who would like to start as an ephemera dealer. And what would I suggest? Should she start doing eBay and so on? And I, I said, don't start with eBay. No. Start with going to the fairs, the most important ephemera fairs. Look at how people are arranging their material. Look at how people are pricing their material. Talk with people. But f- start talking with people who are drawn to the material, who have collections. Why do they collect? And start thinking in ways in which you can feed their collections, in which you can enhance them. And what are you drawn to? And what's going to keep you excited? Now, this is a little Sorry. bit one-sided. We do still buy books. We well, still do maintain and, we don't and develop our own them. reference library. And yes, indeed, we do buy and sell books in very special areas ah, well, they, yes. of our... So it would sort of in another part of the answer to your question would be books that you love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. books that feed you yeah. and yeah. that you can represent passionately in the areas that now we are known to represent uh, you know, expertly, communications history, telegraph yeah. and postal, and the associated transportation themes, we would buy and sell books. And we do uh, the Postmaster it. General's reports. And yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. the, the gov dogs. <laughs> we still do gov dogs. <laughs> our government documents, there is no book business. Yeah, I mean, we, we all have something to do with that. Yep. Yeah. Um, what do you see as some of the great challenges facing the antiquarian book business as we sort of like move into the future? Well, it, for me, the challenge has been to maintain confidence and composers seeming like a dinosaur. It, you know, to mm-hmm. still the kids are all right. We have to trust that they're doing the right thing for their lives, but they're not looking into a world that where we stand to thwart their gaze mm-hmm. so much. Um, and uh, just to uh, be confident that we're still we still have a place, to, a part to play. And uh, I think we do. I think things are coming and going in the way in which we might feel diminished by the onslaught of technology uh, into our uh, trade. Um, But I think we still have an important contribution, and it has a lot to do with what we know about what's in the books, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what we respect for that approach to scholarship, you know, the, the idea of a progressive accumulation of information, not a Wikipedia kind of progress, but something where you you depend upon a lifetime of purpose, vision, dedication to add up to something that can be uh, respect, respectably uh, compiled and transmitted. And I don't see that in the electronic media, although it, uh, it tries to simulate it. But I met, I met two men yesterday at the book fair who came to our booth because we had been listed as specialists in the history of communications. And that's what they're interested in. And one of them collects newspapers because he feels, early newspapers, because he feels that was the really, the nugget of the first, obviously, information revolution. The other man deals in electronic communications. That's his business. Mm. But he's fascinated with how it connects with the older forms, like books. Mm. And one of the things I showed him that really got him interested was a collection of notes passed by Rob's daughter in middle school. She saved them. And you know those notes where you yeah. you folded them intricately and you passed them when the teacher yeah. wasn't looking? I don't know anything about that. No, no, no. <laughs> And accepted those notes. It was a, it's a collection of a hundred of them. Wow. And what are the, what's the content? It's the same as the text messaging amongst the young kids now. You know. And are you saying, how's my? What do you really think of my haircut? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's a tweet. Probably not. Yeah, right. Well, that's a tweet. <laughs> but it is. It's a tweet, and that's what those folded notes were. So he's he's. You like that kind of thing. He did. He did. And he, so he likes seeing the social motivation yeah, that yeah, lies yeah. behind yeah. the expression, the human expression in these various forms. The social right. motivation is, is pretty interesting. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, as an ephemera dealer, 
you probably have an opportunity to buy things almost every place you go. Yes. Because almost every place you would go into would have something that they would call ephemera. Whether yes. you call it or not, I don't know. But yeah. have you found any really incredible things in some incredibly bad place? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? A, a find in a place where you thought you were never going to find anything. Well, that's an interesting wow. question. So fell off with it. Well, this didn't turn out to be something worth a lot of money because I kept it. Oh. But when we were invited to go through the garbage at, <laughs> <laughs> at a house that was being sold, um, we found a Victorian corset. And I, do, I wear Victorian clothing for various presentations, mm-hmm. and I didn't have a Victorian corset, so I thought, great, fabulous. And then Rob, going through different parts of the garbage, had saved different kinds of things. And he saved a little announcement about this particular corset. It was the order form. And it showed me that I was wearing it upside down. (laughs) Well, that's good to know. That's the hourglass figure thing, right? Uh, Yeah. And, And I said, wow, look at this. It's the same corset, only hers has lace at the top and mine has lace at the bottom. Oh, so, I mean, that kind of thing, of course. We well, find... and we've, we've, we've found some very fine things in the garbage. Yes, we have. Uh, oh, dumpster actually. diving? Uh, oh, uh, absolutely. Invitations to dumpster diving. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have to have an invitation now? With well, no, 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 but that's, and you know that's sometimes. a high class dumpster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, for instance, in the Victorian clothing department, we give uh, presentations at Mohonk Mountain House, which is a uh, you know, 140 year old resort in the Catskills. And we were there at one time um, looking at some of the books that they were going to be deaccessioning and giving them advice and buying a few. And while we were loading up our car, we noticed literally in the dumpster there were packages of letters, the original docket, Hmm. and they were kind of grimy. And we said, what's going on here? And they said, oh, that stuff. It was kept in the barn and the rats got at it. It's awful. We're throwing it out. We said, you're throwing it out? But these are, these are docketed files of the hotel. And they said, oh, but they're horrible. Nobody will want them. We said, can we keep them? He said, sure. So we filled our minivan to the roof. Wow. Took it home, dumped it out on the front porch, not inside, got rid of the yeah. Ratchet and so on, and found out that yes, it was. It was there, what they called room letters. It was all the correspondence with their potential clients oh, wow. from mm, roughly 1880 to 1910. And in there, we found uh, George Washington Carver letters wow. and you know, all sorts of wonderful Sounds things. Like wonderful. And we forced some of it back on them. We, we, the, the, their collecting policy, they have their own curator and their own archives, which is exemplary, have the materials from their hotel from their day one. Right. We uh, built collections from this unit f- for their own, gave it back to them, sort of forced this material back upon them. There is another facility at the uh, library in Redlands, which is... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we installed a huge batch of the material with yeah. their Redlands uh, collection and... Uh, and also sold some. Well, the selling part was probably essential. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. At, at one point, I mean, I yeah. to yeah. do that. Um, tell me a little bit about um, the reason that you do book fairs and the reasons that you don't do book fairs. I know there are a lot of people who do the major book fairs, but... I've always found it interesting to do regional book fairs as well. Yeah. Do you, do you find, what, what is the big difference between the regionals and the so-called major leagues? Well, for, mm-hmm. for us, and we just finished the Albany Book Fair, with which I mentioned we already have a long affiliation, the Albany Book Fair is a place to buy. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. Do, we try to do our, we often uh, provide special programming, have a special catalog, a special exhibit. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to go out of our way to do something pro bono because it usually isn't going to make us money, yeah. not at least immediately. We started our collection of the Cold War memorabilia as a special exhibit at an Albany Book Fair, and we're amazed that no one was interested, so we took that as a sign that that should be our, 
Because yeah. nothing was interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, it's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, yeah. it is. So uh, we get to have a l much less encumbered relationship. We get to buy at, at the local book fairs. Um, I'll, I just started today. I'm going to go through this entire book fair. We don't get to buy very much, at least in our area. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of ephemera to buy. But after a while, I'll be able to tell someone who comes to our booth and wants to know where a copy of such and such is. I'll be able to walk yeah. them over and help one of our colleagues. Uh, well, I think a lot of us do that kind of thing. Yes. In the book. Yeah. yeah. It's one of our responsibilities to our I th to I the culture. I think it is. Uh, too few do it, though. Yes. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of things that the that the change in me media with how books are exposed has. Uh, all, there's been a culture of book fair doing that I think either did not mature or at least has lapsed. People no longer we we observe see that it's in not only your own benefit, but for the benefit of everybody else who's at the fair, to still write those letters and invite those customers mm -hmm. and, and to make that kind of social connection that keeps them coming to the book fairs, for, not only for whatever they, you might have for them, but just for the, the good of all of us. I think the internet has taken the sting out of the wonder of book fairs. Do you remember the electricity oh, that you of used course. to feel yes. at a book fair 20, oh. 15, 20 years ago? Yes. There, there is not that feeling in recent dates at any book fair. Right, and, and that goes for the other areas of collecting that we link with, stamp shows similarly. It's, it's the same thing at the stamp shows as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, the, when we were setting up two days ago, there was a feeding frenzy at the Caliban at bookshop. Caliban, yeah, yeah. I saw that. And I think those are booksteller, booksellers still demonstrating their passion for what yeah, they absolutely. do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, they want... Uh, we we want to feel that. That's why we 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 do this because we want to, and we're still there available for those who might want to share that with us. There may be something in the general anesthetic uh, effect of the electronic media. You know, people are no longer have these their wonder on their faces. You know, <laughs> yeah. They're not wearing the, their emotions on their yeah, sleeves so much. True. You can't. Uh, that, that may be, uh, you know, our, our social practices are different. It may be that, the, that there are still these passions to be brought yeah. forth, but we don't see them when they open so much. No, not, not, not so much anymore. No, yeah. but this fair particularly, I find, is good for um, young people coming to see what the things actually look like. San Francisco's the same way. And San Francisco's yeah, the same there, way. There seems to be a lot of curiosity yes. among younger people. But yeah. I find them more visually oriented yes. rather than print oriented. Yes. Yes. And that's a problem we have in ephemera too. The, the original uh, group of ephemeras, a lot of them are visual artists of one sort or another. They were looking at the image, the aesthetic appeal of the image. And while we certainly could uh, participate with them in that, our, our bent is has it's felt content. always our contribution for the manuscript material, the manuscript archive, the, the what's in it, you know, rather than the, 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 yeah. the archive itself. Yeah. Last question before I let you guys go. Um, if a young person comes to you, uh, and I think you partially answered it, uh, and says to you, hey guys, I, I'd like to be in the trade, um, what would be the best piece of advice you might want to give them? We gobble them up. Yes, we'd say, can you come live with us? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, in, in you believe the old, in the apprentice system. Yes, exactly. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, we, try, we try to capture our friends' children, you know, <laughs> when they are, are footloose and they have skills. And, true. and we can put them at work. Yep. Uh, we, are, we have a project that we are, even, well, three young people in the last year would have, whether or not they will ever become book sellers or ephemeris They'll or see it whatever, first hand, they anyway. always have a feeling for it. But I would say two things, I, and I do, I always tell younger people this. One is to follow your passions, because that goes for every area of your life. And the other one is keep your overhead low. Well, that's a good, a good advice. The overhead parts especially. <laughs> right, because that's what we've done. Um, it's, and that's critical who are being able to relax in a business where you're always at risk or your livelihood's always at risk. Um, 
So that, those are my two. Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael.